I'll just start off by saying thank you to everyone. We're so lucky to have access to such an amazing athlete, and we hope you guys um, enjoy getting to speak with her and ask her some questions. Yeah, I'd like to welcome everyone, too. Um, I, I'm at home here in Casanova, New York. I've been here, like, almost longer than eight weeks now, so we're getting a little itchy to leave, but these times have been a little difficult and strange for some of us, but it's also maybe created some new and innovative things like this this little chat room here that we that Ariat has done. So thank you to them for doing that, and I hope you guys get a lot of benefit out of this. We're just gonna kind of go around the room, as I'd like to say, um, and have everyone ask you um, one of the questions that they had sent in. Let's start with um, Mary Gibson. So one of my questions was, what's your favorite training technique for like bringing like younger horses along and whatnot? What I like to do with my young horses and my old horses is a lot of exercises with just rails on the ground that simulate fences. Um, sometimes I'll even put, use cavalettis that raise up off the ground or put standards by the rails so I can make them, you know, maybe 12 inches off the ground or, or less. But because um, I think it doesn't put a lot of stress on them for jumping and you can work on a lot. Like uh, I'll have three rails on the ground in a straight line, 45 feet apart, and try to do three strides between uh, both of them, then four strides. Um, my best, my top horses or most made horses can do three strides and then five sides in the next one. So that's a, that's a big adjustability question there. And I think the key to a lot of success is having a, a lot of adjustability or rideability, whatever you want to call it in your horses. So I like to work with the rails a lot. You can, you can do a lot of variations of that. You can put them almost 60 feet apart you can put them you can put some on a diagonal so you have to work on bending lines as well and I think you get a lot of benefit out of that um, without jumping the horses a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi BZ thanks so much for doing this with us today. Um, I have a million questions but I only get one so I, I have a 20 year old jumper and he's still competitive we do the the meter five with him and at that level when they're at that age you know their job really well what type of exercises be it like gymnastics or courses what type of work would you do jumping wise with a horse like that the fact that he's 20 years old and you're still competing that's great you're doing a lot right <laughs> um i think uh he's uh, with an older horse i don't think they need a whole lot but what they do need is you don't want to leave them for four or five five weeks or something and then all of a sudden jump them a lot you know you have to think of yourself if you were to train in the gym and then not train in the gym or maybe you run or something but if you don't do it for a while and then you do it again it, it makes you sore so I think you have to do often enough that um, they don't get sore when you do want to compete with them so I would say you know maybe some jumping sessions if you if you're doing it just in between shows, I would probably give them a week without jumping and then maybe throw in a jumping session or two during the week. I'm, I mean, I'm assuming since you're an amateur, it's nice to practice as well. And if he's a bit strong and anxious, it's a bit good to have, you have definitely have something to work on. So, but my answer to that would be also a lot of rails on the ground and Cavaletti type work because the jumps don't need to be real big to, to work on his rideability and making him not anxious and also just to make keep his muscles fit for jumping uh it doesn't need to be big fences so you know i would throw in as many you can make a whole course out of rails on the ground and do a lot with that so um i think that's a good real good thing for an older horse hi um thank you so much for getting on the call my question was how do you keep your horses like sound and healthy while you compete and travel Hi, Lizzie. Yeah, that's a good question. That's probably one of the biggest responsibilities we have, um, being trainers and riders. And I think a big part of that is scheduling. So, I mean, with our top horses, if they show twice a month, that's about maximum for them. Um, and I think, you know, we try to pick, pick things that we want to peak for, maybe. And if we have to qualify for something, we have to plan that in, too. So we sit down at the beginning of the year or maybe even before that, and we decide what course we want to aim for which event and 
and how we're going to do that. So I think planning ahead is a big part of keeping them sound and having their schedule be something that they can handle. Um, the other thing is uh, fitness. You know, they, they need to stay fit enough in between the shows that when you do go to get them ready for the show or, and show that you don't make them sore doing that. And I think also a lot of really good flat work mm -hmm. is good for them. I think uh, done really well, it's almost a bit of a chiropractic type therapy if you do really good flat work. And I think here, uh, like on our farm, we have a lot of hills. So that's really nice to keep a horse fit is to go up and down the hills. Um, even on the trail rides, they have to go up and down the hills. So um, it's really good for keeping them fit without a lot of stress. And the other thing is, you know, every time you start your, your, your riding session, I pick up a trot and I trot a little one direction, trot a little the other direction and make sure my horse feels like he should. You know, some, some horses start out a little different than others, but if they stay consistent about it, that's okay. Um, most of ours start up very good. I'm lucky with that. Knock on wood right now. But um, just always paying attention to that. Is it, or is the horse starting to jump to the side and he didn't used to jump to the side? Um, just little things like that you need to pick up on and try to catch anything that might be a problem. You try to catch it before it is a big problem. Um, a lot of times we'll have, after we've done a, a show or two shows or or we come back from a series of shows, we'll have our vet come just to go through all the horses and see them uh, after, after the show. And then we, you know, we, we generally she'll, she'll flex, they'll flex them and make sure that uh, we haven't gotten any big problems since last time they saw them. And it's good for them to look at the horse and be able to follow the progression of the horse. And, you know, if, you, if they just see it on a one-time basis, it's tough for them to get a real feel for what what its strong points are where its weak points are so we try to keep them involved whether we have a problem or not um so i think that's our best best way of keeping them sound um so one question i had for you was i wanted you to think back to when you were a junior rider um did you ever envision like this career for yourself being so successful and what advice do you have for junior riders who look up to you and aspire to ride like you one day to answer the first question, no, I didn't ever really imagine that I would have this career. I'm not a real overconfident person, you know. I don't think uh, that I'm better than a lot of other people or anything like that. And also, it, it took me, I mean, I was 40 years old before I rode in my first Olympic Games. So uh, it does, you know, we're, we're very lucky with our sport in that way that we can go on for a lot of years and compete. It's not like a gymnast who has a very small window of opportunity to to make it to the top so i think some advice i would have is have some patience with it you know do things the right way try to learn uh, everything about the horse and horsemanship and riding develop your skills um do it properly through the levels and and try to learn to ride along the way you know a lot some people can get a lot of results in the ring but they really aren't that educated in riding or preparing the horse to go to the rain or schooling the horse at home. And I think that's a big transition for juniors into the professional. Sometimes, you know, you go from being the person that's learning and the horse is a bit of a schoolmaster for you and to your role changes a little bit. You have to be the one teaching the horse after a while. And uh, I think that's step takes a long time. I feel like I'm still, getting better at that you know it, it, it's just a lot of a lot of repetition a lot of practice a lot of um you know we make some mistakes along the way that's part of it that's part of learning um you know I probably had some horses earlier in my career that I could have done better with now but that was that was then you know it's kind of spilt milk now but um I think that's just a part of our career and I think if you have patience with that and try to get with uh, the best people you can to learn along the way. I think that's the, the fastest way to the top. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, huge fan of yours. I saw you down in Palm Beach a couple of times when I was doing show grooming back before I have my new career. But um, mm -hmm. my question for you, I've owned uh, 
quite a few horses now. Um, I actually just adopted a off the track thoroughbred mare. I've pretty much only had mares once I got my first. I pretty much didn't go back. Um, but this mare specifically, she um, we think she was adopted out by some polo people before I got her. And we think she kind of got ran at some fences improperly um, and she's a little bit nervous now coming into them and she's actually got a lot of potential she balances as well she's pretty handy already um, but what uh, advice you have for horses like that where you're just trying to regain the confidence with them and get the jumping a little bit better just take it slow I, I know she's probably off the track and maybe a little older than like a four or five year old by now but um she just turned I, five. Oh, good so yeah. that's good thing. um so I mean, just take it slow. If she's if she's nervous about something, again, rails on the ground, a little bigger, some trotting jumps so that they learn that they don't have to run at the fences. If you can teach her cavaletti so that you can regulate her trot to the fence, that would help. Um, I think just anything you can mess around with and maybe don't make it a big schooling session, you know? It, when you're when you're working the horse around and there's a little trot little cross rail or a rail on the ground that you can trot over just let her plop over it if she will and just do that off and on here and there and then you know some days you might take where you do a little more jumping and stuff like that or set up a gymnastic with and always use some ground lines to help okay. her to help her judge her distance and help her style a little bit i, I use that we use them with all young horses so that they learn uh, so that they don't get scared about their front end um, and learn to put the jump more in the middle of their arc. Um, just really basic uh, exercises until she relaxes about it and then she'll tell you when she's ready to do more. That sounds great, thank you. My question is what is your general weekly training routine for your top horses when you're at home? Like how many times a week do you just flat work? go on a trail ride, school jumps, that type of thing? It depends a little on their show schedule. Like I would say mm -hmm. if I took our year, generally we do uh, obviously the circuit in Wellington. Um, so while they're there, the first few weeks we're trying to get them fitter. So, you know, they get pretty much every day, first few weeks uh, as we're getting mm -hmm. ready to show, they probably jump some week, some weeks twice a week some weeks they jump three times a week um and then maybe before mm -hmm. we show they'd get a week off of jumping um right before because they're not that fit then as they get fitter and the circuit goes on they would show and then get a week of no not jumping and then if we needed to get them ready a little, or wanted to do something to jump them to get them a little more prepared for the next show which could it be only a week later? We'd probably jump them one time before that competition. If they have two or three weeks off, they might jump a couple times as we get close to their next competition. So, and then I'd say um, we get home from Florida and they get maybe a couple weeks, a week, almost two weeks of just going out in the field if, it, if the weather is good for that or trail riding or light pack, um, but really no, mental stress or or any physical stress to them and then we start to gear them up again for the spring generally now here we've obviously had a longer time period so what we've been doing here is probably serious flat work for three or four days of the week and then trail ride or light hack or sometimes just turn out for two two of the other days and we always give them a day off um generally mondays so They've been staying fit enough, and some of them that only did a little bit of jumping in, in Florida got jumped uh, a couple times a week, every other week, um, just to keep their level of fitness, or to keep improving their level of fitness. And, you know, during, this, during the show year, I'd say similar to what we did in Florida, when they, if they're already up and competing, we try and give them breaks of not jumping for a week at least and then maybe one or two schools to get them ready for their next competition. Mm -hmm. When they're having their week off of not jumping, you know, it might be one or two days of trail riding and the rest flat work, pretty good flat work. I have more of a like groundwork type 
question. Um, I have a six-year-old warm blood who was um, fairly roughly handled before I got him. I've had him for about three months. He's actually very well behaved under saddle, but on the ground, he's kind of nervous and standoffish in new situations. Uh, so I've been working a lot with him with positive reinforcement, and he's gotten to be a lot more trusting. But I was wondering what you would do to approach a horse like that and help them gain their confidence back. The positive re reinforcement is a great thing. Um, I don't, you probably know we've worked with that some. But um, I think, you know, just messing with him and always being quiet with your movements around him, not rushing. Um, you know, we, I'm not a huge treat giver, but I do think giving them treats every now and then helps mm -hmm. to relax them with you around them. Not so much that they get obnoxious about it, but you're already right. doing some of that with the positive reinforcement. Um, and I think, yeah, just, just any time you can spend, if you have a few minutes, go in the stall and mess with them a little bit. Um, I think, I think it just is going to take time um, and being careful with how you move around them. You know, don't do something, stand right in front of them and do something that threatens them. Um, I don't know how he is on the cross ties, but careful with the cross ties if he's, if he's a bit defensive. Just really just spending time and developing a relationship with him. I don't think there's any real shortcuts to it. And I think, you know, if he's, if he's good to ride, he'll probably get good on the ground as well with you over time. Thank you so much for doing this. I love your Madden Method videos and letting us into your stable a little bit. I love that. So thanks for doing this too. So my question is, over the years of riding, I found that when I'm showing or just riding in general, I have little nuggets of wisdom that my trainers have instilled in me, like ringing in my head as I'm riding. And I was wondering if you have that and what that is that's ringing in your head through the years of training and the Olympics and just showing and <laughs> kind of what the best piece of advice you, you've been given is that stuck with you? There's a few, like I'd say, especially now once you get to the point where you're, you're past your junior career and you're, you've learned a lot and it's kind of your time to start being the trainer of the horse and teaching the horse. I think you really have to think of the best interest of the horse first all the time. And I think that helps in a lot of decision-making. Um, and I think one of the best bits of advice actually my husband and I had was from a guy named Ronnie Mazzarella, who was a British chef to keep probably 15 years ago. And uh, he was a really great guy. And one day we were at a, we were in a show in Europe and he said, I think you're going to win the Grand Prix today. He said to my husband and he, John said, well, what makes you think that? He said, well, you have a good horse and a good rider. And I think, I think you're going to win the Grand Prix. And John said, all right, well, any advice you, that I can give to uh, Beezy to make sure that happens? And he said, yeah, when you, she's going in the ring, tell her to have fun. And John, he kind of laughed at him and he said, you've got to be kidding. He said, what do you, why is that? Why would I tell her to have fun? Why is that going to help her? And he said, because she's a good rider and a good horse and, if she goes in there and has fun, she'll allow herself to be the best, do the best she can. So I think it sounds strange, but that was a good, good advice. You know, if you, I think that's something that's always a good confidence thing too, is almost, I don't necessarily say have fun, but I say go in there and show off how well you're going to do, how well you can do it. You know, instead of going in there being worried about making a mistake, you have to go in and, and, and feel like I'm going to show everybody how, how good I can do this is the attitude. So that's, that's my biggest one, I'd say. Thank you so much. Yeah. I've given, been given the opportunity to start riding a 14-year-old mare that had done the Grand Prix, but she's stepping down now. But when I ride her, she gets very tense, and she tends to climb at the walk, trot, and canter. But mm -hmm. once I can get her to relax, um, she has three beautiful gates. But is there any other suggestions you have just to get her to kind of relax and come around? You want to be soft to allow them to relax. But at the same time, I think horses also like a little guidance and a little discipline. And that sometimes tends to relax them. So like when you, 
when you say you use a little hand and seat, I would, you know, make sure she, she listens to the half halt and stuff like that enough that you feel like you can let go and have her relax. I think um, sometimes people make a mistake of almost being too passive and too soft. And then the horse feels a little lost or feels like they can get a, just do what they want to do. So I would make sure you do put her in a frame for a little bit and then she shouldn't feel clamped in that frame. But it sounds like you're kind of on basically on the right track. Ask her to do something and then give her the chance to, you know, give her a little release so she has a chance to relax about what she's doing. Lots of little shoulder in, shoulder out little leg yield each direction that she kind of has to accept your leg and your hand together but she also has a way to a release you know that you you re ask her to give you the movement and then relax everything and then ask her to give her the movement and then relax everything so that it, she doesn't feel clamped into doing anything and yet she still has to accept the aids I think that's the biggest thing with some horse like that is getting to getting them to accept the aids okay. and maybe use the soft. I don't know if she can take a rubber snaffle or something like that where she maybe is encouraged to chew the bit or take the bit a little more. I have a bit of a different question. Um, not so much training related, but uh, I just graduated high school. So I'm kind of trying to figure out where I'm going. Mm -hmm. uh, next year and I was wondering what you did when you first started out so I have options to be a working student as well as a groom for some top level riders but I was wondering like where would you recommend starting with that like where would I learn the most and be able to get into the industry more whatever job you can get with the best people you know involved so if you could get a grooming job with with a top level trainer um, I would probably take that if you could get a working. I was really lucky because I got a working student job with Katie Perdant when I got out of school. So um, I kind of had the best of both worlds. I had one of my own horses to ride. And um, as I got better and better, you know, at first I was not doing a lot of grooming, but I was braiding, tap, doing the equipment management, uh, entries, stuff like that. So it was a lot of. Uh, a lot of work that probably didn't do a lot for my riding, but I got the occasional riding I got to do on other horses was really valuable. And, um, but if I had had the chance to start there as a groom, I would have done that as well, because I think, you know, especially these days, a lot of grooms are expected to do some riding. So if they see you ride and they're impressed with the way you ride or they're impressed with just your work ethic, I think they're, they, people will be willing to invest in you. Um, and I think always make sure that you present yourself in a professional manner all the time. You know, if, you're, if your goal is to be professional in a sport, really present yourself, always be dressed well, always be well-spoken, but not, not uh, a know-it-all. Um, I think watch what you put on social media. I think that's one of the first things people look at these days when they get a resume or somebody that wants to be a working student. You know, you can look them up on social media and see what kind of person they are from that. So I know that's one of the first things we do. So be mindful of that when you're doing your social media. Hi, Lizzie. I am, like, a huge fan of you. Like, I don't even know, like, what to say. Um, my <laughs> question for you is when you walk a course for your classes, what do you look for and what do you analyze the most in order to prepare yourself for the most successful round that you could have? When we walk the course, obviously we're walking the distances, deciding um, the strides that we want to do between the fences, how we're going to have, if it's going to be a long or short distance, um, if there's an option, what's best for each horse. Um, but what you really need to look at too is the surroundings and the material of the jumps. You know, if it's a real solid looking fence, you're going to have to ride it a little stronger. If it's a real airy looking fence, you can ride it a little more delicate. Um, what came before that fence, what came after that fence. Uh, it's all important to planning what you're going to do to ride that course clear. Um, the other thing I really like to do is to kind of segment the course. So I think 
when you look at a course um, of, okay, if you're in a Grand Prix or something, it's, it's can be 14 fences um, with some combinations involved. It can look a little overwhelming at first. But if you take it and, and segment it into different, maybe three, four different sections, you know, you have the first line, okay, that's just a simple bending six or something like that. And then, you know, you have another line that's maybe more of a gymnastic line, but you can say, okay, I know how to do that. We've done that before. I've done it at home. I practice that a lot. Okay. And then you have the next line that's a little different gymnastic line. You know, you can, you can just segment it and then it pieces itself together after that. I think that helps you re remember the course for one thing. And I think it also helps you kind of break it down into <laughs> something that looks doable instead of something that looks very overwhelming. I am an amateur who has spent the past five years showing predominantly in a side saddle. Um, and I have been spending my lockdown quarantine period um, trying to work on making my leg more effective in a regular saddle. Um, but I'm also really short. So when people kind of tell you just wrap your leg around the horse, that doesn't really always mean something to me. Um, so my question would be, is when you're working on uh, creating an effective leg with your students, especially if they're a short woman, what do you recommend? Well, first of all, I'm impressed that you can ride side saddle. <laughs> that looks hard to me. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, I don't have the longest legs in the world either, but you have to really, uh, still try to length it sounds funny but try to lengthen your leg a little you know ride uh, on the flat with your stirrups um not not that your knee is straight or anything but try to make it as long as you're still comfortable with and that you still get your heels down and your leg still is effective um and i when i jump i tend to go up three four holes sometimes so don't be afraid when you're jumping to go with what you're comfortable with um, I think anytime you want to try to lengthen your leg, a good thing is working a little without stirrups too, because it makes your seat more secure, your leg a little stronger. Um, anytime I feel like I've gone from jumping in, in short stirrups to flat length stirrups and they feel really long, just, I just drop my stirrups for a little bit, work a little without stirrups, and then all of a sudden the stirrups feel kind of short again already. So, um. I think the working without stirrups is probably the biggest biggest uh, opportunity for you to make your legs stronger and more secure. And um, and then, like I say, when you when you do jump, uh, feel free to shorten them. You know, I I think it's hard to, especially the bigger the fences get or the the harder a horse jumps, the shorter I'll go with my stirrups. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, my horse jumps fairly hard. So yeah. I feel like sometimes I'm like, well, maybe I should have my stirrup longer so that I should stay in the saddle and then I kind of get left behind. So that that is heartening yeah. to hear. Oh, uh, make it short. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You guys all had great questions. And um, so I think you probably, even though you got to only ask one question, you probably learned a lot from all the other questions too, because they were all good ones. So, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, thanks for allowing me. It was fun. Mm -hmm.